Good morning and welcome to this latest webinar from thebusinessdesk.com in partnership with Shawbrook Bank. I'm Ben Ormsby, I'm the Yorkshire editor at thebusinessdesk.com and today it's my pleasure to be joined by an expert panel as we discuss all things employee ownership. So the latest data from the Employee Ownership Association says that businesses that are employee owned are more productive, more innovative, more resilient to economic turbulence, all very good in the current times in which we're living. But with over 830 businesses currently fitting into that bracket of employee owned and the number predicted to surpass a thousand this year, what does it actually mean? And how do you start that road and that journey to what, well, if we believe everything the association says is the promised land. So again, I've got an expert panel who are gonna talk everything from the financial and legal obligations and also a business who's been through it, it will tell us if it's as good as it gets. So without further ado, uh, I will ask my panel to introduce themselves and to answer one question. Uh, so starting with you, Dan, I think we'll go with first. Can you introduce yourself and explain why perhaps you see the increase in employee ownership coming forward at the minute? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Daniel Martin, Senior Director uh, for Shawbrook Bank, uh, based out of the Manchester office, club in the northwest. Um, great to meet everybody. Um, why do I think there's an uh, increase in employee ownership? Obviously, there's a lot of data out there saying uh, employee ownership trusts are um, are more sustainable, grow more sustainably, more resilient. All the things you just covered off, uh, really, Ben. Uh, and that coupled with some of the the tax benefits and the drive to retain quality staff. I think has seen uh, is why we're seeing the increases. Fantastic. Well, you mentioned tax, so I'll go next to, to Susie to introduce herself and yeah, answer the same question. Thanks, Ben. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Susie Harris Mills. I'm one of the tax partners at BHP. Um, my role primarily involves advising owners, owner managed businesses and their owners about their personal tax planning, and making sure it's aligned to the business too. Um, I don't think you asked me a question there, but if you... It, if you it, was, it was the same my, one as to Dan. It's yeah, as my, my take on it. it yeah, very similar. And I think actually COVID has made people think even more about it because I think a lot of businesses have experienced their employees really stepping up, um, you know, out of their, you know, normal role. And it's given some business owners confidence that actually the next generation are ready. Um, and it's also made, you know, business owners think about their own personal situation and maybe wanting to retire a bit sooner than they would have before. Fantastic. Uh, just because you're next on my screen, we'll go to Anna. Uh, so to introduce yourself and again, why you think we're seeing this, this rise in EOTs. Thanks, Ben. Morning, everybody. Um, good to meet you all. I'm Anna Robson. I'm a banking partner at Shoesmiths in Leeds. Previously worked at DLA Piper, excuse me, for 17 years. Um, I specialise partly now over the last year on doing more and more um, EOTs. So that's acting both from a bank perspective who are funding them or from the company side who are obviously looking to raise finance in order to assist with an EOT. And I think for me, the reason why they're becoming more popular from a legal perspective is that it's just it's understanding. You know, people are seeing that these are more and more common that people are doing it, and that the banks and other funders are sort of happy to provide funding for these transactions as well now, whether that's in line with them doing them at the same time as the EOT or refinancing at the point to ensure that the funds are moving up the group sort of at a later date. So I think it's an, a wider understanding and availability um, is sort of driving it. I think we'll go to you next, Hamish, to introduce yourself and again, yeah, give your view on why they're, they're seeing the increase. Morning, everyone. Um, Hamish Morrison. I'm joint managing partner of BHP and also a corporate finance partner within BHP. So very much advising on the commercial aspects of EOTs. Um, I, I, I think I'd, I'd agree with most of what's been said. I think it's certainly as more of these things have happened, people people are more comfortable doing them. Um, the, the tax has driven the initial interest. What I would say, and we'll come on to this later, I'm sure, is that tax is definitely not the reason to do it. It's, it's, it's usually what sort of gets people thinking about it, but it shouldn't be the reason you do it. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, leaving Matt to the end, because he might have a slightly different view uh, as a business going through it. So, Matt, do you want to introduce yourself and, yeah, tell us uh, why you think you've seen the EOTs rise? Sure. Uh, morning, everybody. My name is Matt Smith. I'm the CEO of an international B2B marketing agency, BDB. Uh, we transitioned to 100% employee ownership in February 2021, uh, supported by Shawbrook. 
Um, I think, yeah, echo a lot of the sentiments that have already been said. Obviously, it should be kind of a win-win situation. So you've got tax benefits to the vendor alongside a more collaborative, egalitarian ownership structure for the team. I think in reality, what's driving it alongside what's been said so far is more the ever-evolving and changing demands of a multi-generational workforce and some of the younger guys in the team. I think you hear a lot of businesses say you're in it together, but ultimately when that's just lining the pockets of the business owner, it's difficult to authentically represent that in this day and age. So EOT is a way to a path and a journey towards um, you know, sharing the wealth amongst the people that contribute to that, to the efforts. Fantastic. So if anyone does have questions for our panel, do put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and I'll pass them to the uh, yeah, to the panellists as they as we go through. But yeah, you've all summed up uh, the potential reasons why we're seeing that rise. I guess the interesting part is that process to become an employee owned. Can, you know, how, how long, do, well, perhaps how far ahead do we have to be thinking, you know, and how long can that process take? And I might start, I'll start with you, Hamish, on that one. You know, how, how do you see that, that process coming about? Yeah, I think the first thing is to actually sort of understand what is the aim um, as the business owner. And I think any any good advisor will sort of genuinely question you on that. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, "I want to do an EOT," the first question I'll be asking is why, and understanding, you know, what what are the what are the, what, commercially what is it they're trying to achieve, um, and and really challenging whether that is the best option. Talking somebody through those alternative options, the process itself is relatively quick. Um, it, it partly depends as to whether you're raising external debt or whether you're funding out of existing cash and deferred consideration, and then potentially looking to introduce debt further down the line. Um, but, but in all honesty, sort of doing it in a two, three months is, is very achievable. So, Wow. So, and, I, and I guess, you know, you, you, you touched on it there that perhaps the, there's reasons that people think they should do it early on and perhaps ones that they then maybe you, you'd say they, they wouldn't be the main be all and end all for the reason for doing an EOT. What what are the ones that you think maybe people misunderstand and, and lead people to this approach before before you 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 or other advisors have those conversations? I, th I think sometimes they've been through a failed sales process and and they see an EOT as as a way of um, sell it, selling the business. Um, but you know it's it's a big cultural change and you, you know you, you set you touched on it at the start. You know the fact that employee ownership businesses in theory are you know have a more engaged workforce. You know, I'm sure Matthew will tell you, you don't get a more engaged workforce just because you become an EOT. You have a highly engaged workforce because you do loads of great stuff and you might do loads of great stuff as part of an EOT, but an EOT in itself isn't sort of going to change anything overnight. And in actual fact, if you don't plan it properly and then implement it properly, you make it a lot worse. You know, there's the, you, you run the risk with the, the natural way that everybody bene you know, benefits from it. If you don't sort of get that communication clear at the start, the risk is that you end up feeling like, uh, you know, making decisions by committee and ultimately, you know, the business still needs to have a management structure, clear leadership and, and, and be run well. The fact that everybody benefits from those decisions being hopefully good decisions is what changes, not not how you run it day to day. And, and Dan, you know, you sure book of, of clear, clear helped Matt uh, and uh, on that sort of journey uh, and, and, D, and BDB, but, you know, how 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 open to EOTs and, and funding those is sure booking and do you see is it are our lenders more open to that now than they have been before yeah I, I think the the lending market is slowly grasping the EOT ownership structure would I say a lot of people have got there no I think we, we've done six or seven EOT transactions um, and have a good understanding of them um, I think Hamish uh, mentioned the most important thing to us is why they're doing the EOT and is the EOT the right fit the right fit for the business um, but I think throughout the funding landscape I think people are getting more and more okay with with EOTs and probably understanding them more and more as as we go through the cycle because let's face it if you go back four or five years if you said EOT to someone and they might have said John Lewis but other than that um, there wasn't a lot about was there uh, Anna, I could see you nodding, nodding along. If you, if you, uh, you know, you got something you'd like to add to, to Dan's points? No, I, I think it's just it's been phenomenal how quickly the banks and other funders have generally just sort of adopted it and 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 moving now. You know, you you're getting regular calls saying, "Oh, we're doing an EOT funding. This is the structure." And I think that overall general understanding of how it works, but also that flexibility of being able to fund up front or have the deferred consideration, which just provides an additional 
option. So other than on a traditional sale where you're looking at, you know, the majority of costs up front, maybe with some deferred, you've got so many other options in terms of a longer term funding package, um, which the banks are really happy to support, particularly given that a lot of the deferred consideration is being funded from business revenue. You've got a strong business that's, that's producing cash. Um, it's to me, it's a really, really great business for a bank to support. Yeah, what I would say from a funding perspective, though, it's just like any other transaction. Yeah. So whilst it might only take three months to do the EOT, I think to, to, to fund it, you've got to make sure you've got the right advisors in place, you've got the right financial controls, you're producing quality management information, because at the end of the day, most EOTs will be funded by some form of a cash flow loan if they're taking consideration off the table and the business has to stand up to diligence and the financial rigor to be able to repay that so in the round if you're raising debt and taking money out i would i would view it like any other traditional transaction in terms of preparation if it's the fact that you're just putting loan notes on and, fu and funding it that way then it makes it a bit easier but if you if you wanted some consideration up front um it, 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 i would say we'll treat it like any other transaction in terms of the the preparation that goes into it sure also it's also interesting on that point dan i know it's seen as quite a simple transaction sounds quite, quite a smooth process it doesn't mean the professional fees are any less so it's just something that's worth <laughs> from the business owner's perspective there's still some lumpy professional fees that are attached to it when you go into it like you would with any other refinance or transaction so yeah, and there's, there's some different fees as well. So, you know, you forget that you've got not just the trust, you also have the trustee. And then you, if you've got the overseas, so the offshore elements as well, mm -hmm. you've got to have, they've got to have the independent advice. So whilst you'll have your BHPs and everybody setting up, um, you know, the structures, you, you need, all those people still need to get that separate advice and it all needs to fit in. They'll probably want advice on the banking documents as well. There's the SBA. Any acquisition process takes quite a long time in terms of that. So those elements, as Dan says, are still there. Um, you just need to make sure that everybody's sort of working in parallel to make it as smooth as possible. Yeah. I think, no, no, I, I think no. the legal, so I was going to say, I think it's the other bit with the legal agreements, which is absolutely critical for me is, you know, if I've got a lot of deferred consideration and fundamentally I'm, you know, I'm either selling a majority or I'm selling a hundred percent. I really need to make sure that in terms of how the business is going to be run going forward is a way which I'm comfortable with, but I also got sufficient protections in terms of making sure that I do ultimately get my full proceeds out of the business you know and from a bank's point of view they they need to understand what happens if the business isn't trading well who whose responsibility is it who's going to who's going to turn the business around and get it back on track and these these are the bits where you know we've seen a number of EOTs been implemented fairly poorly in all honesty where people have sold it as a tax product the professional fees will have been cheap but ultimately they've ended up with a structure that doesn't work because no, no thought's been given to any of these things. And the, the only thought that's gone has been into, you know, achieving a 0% tax rate. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, to, you know, taking that point, do, do you think that we might see some of these ones that have happened over the last few years that have, have gone that way as, a, as being sold as a tax product? They, they, they might not work moving forward and they, they might need, need rethinking again. In the, in the not too distant future. Yeah. Well. I think it depends what you mean by, by not work, because if the, if the only debt in them is deferred consideration, you might end up with a business owner who never gets all the deferred consideration out, or it takes them, you know, 25 years to get their money out and send, instead of the six years that was intended. Um, the, you know, the, the advantage they've got in those situations is, you know, presumably they were very profitable businesses before, so they might be half as profitable going forwards, but if they're half as profitable going oh. forwards, they the business will continue to exist, but you know what it won't necessarily do is continue to flourish. Um, we have our first question from Erica, who's asked, would the panel be able to comment perhaps on the, the pros and cons of a spin out versus going to an EOT? Um, so does anyone want to attempt to have a, have a stab at that one? And I'm looking at you all and you're all doing the classic thing where you look away from your canvas to avoid my eye gaze. So uh, Matt, Matt's smuggling to go, well, that's not really one for me, so I'm OK. Uh, I'll go for it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but when, we, when we appraise what, what the routes, what the options were ahead of us, I think the pandemic gave a lot of people the opportunity to reflect on what the long term plans were for their businesses. So did they want to do a trade sale? Did they want to go on a buy and build strategy? And we sat down as a board and ultimately we're a service based business and the biggest barrier and opportunity for us is to attract and retain the right talent to work with our clients so the EOT structures seem the right option for us in terms of a spin out an MBO an MBA there's, there's so many different options you can do 
but in a service-based business where you're so reliant on your team, it, it seems like a natural play to kind of go down that more egalitarian route. Um, any of the other structures, ultimately, yes, the team would be paid a salary and yes, they'd get a bonus, but beyond that, wouldn't share in the, the upside or the wealth and the overall performance of the business. So that's what made the EOT appealing to us, but we've also got the culture embedded in the business that reflects that. So I think as Hamish was saying, if, if you're going into this for a tax break, it's, it's not the right route. Um, I'm sure somebody can give you a more technical rundown of a spin out, but in the sense of there's so many options when you are looking at, you know, moving on the business and this for us was the natural choice. I think the, the other big consideration for me is, is what, you know, it comes back to commercially, what do you want to achieve? If your ultimate aim is to achieve the highest possible price for selling your business, that is unlikely to be via an EOT because, you know, an, an EOT, you know, generally speaking, we would advise that you get a, you know, a high quality, decent valuation done to make sure that it's a robust structure going forward from a tax point of view. And if you're doing that, that valuation by its nature is not going to factor in what a strategic buyer who, you know, sees, sees value in the business may be willing to overpay in a competitive trade sale process. Um, but, you know, we, we see a number of people who are happy to actually get a, you know, a fair price for their business and make sure that they're given the opportunity to the wider employee base. Um, it's a very different, you know, take on life to somebody who, who you know, who feels they've established a business, worked hard and just wants to, you know, maximize their proceeds. Neither, you know, neither is wrong. It's just, just your take on life. Matt made a good point that obviously for, for his business, it, it, it was the right fit because it was the people, people of the commodity within within the within BDB. You know, are there sectors where you think EOTs just don't feel quite the right fit? Or or is it is it actually that that's a very naive look from my point of view and I don't mind if that is the answer. And does anyone want to attempt to attempt to give me I, I, I think it's all I don't think you can exclude any particular sector. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it does work very well for people businesses like Matt's um that that rely that are heavily reliant on the people to to perform well and it's attracting talent that effectively leads to a better business and and they're big barriers to to growth at the moment aren't they particularly um but i don't think you can exclude any any individual sector i just think it depends on the culture and the makeup of the the management team and and the staff and and what the what the reasons are for 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 doing it if you've got i don't know i always think if you've got a business that's been run by an md for a number of years and he's the key individual and he makes all the decisions and always has done and uh, there's not much succession planning there is a succession plan just doing an eot no i think you've got again that's all on the planning and the succession please so you don't just do an eot you have to plan and su to still do succession to be able to do the eot anyway rather than just uh, a means to an end in getting your cash out. And, and Susie, we're going to go back to the, the, the joys of tax. Um, that you know, It's been touched on that there are, there are definite tax benefits for these. Um, you know, what, can you explain a little bit more about those and, and, and why they're, it's a key consideration for some businesses when they're starting this? Yeah, so, so fundamentally, the, the main um, condition is that you have to, as a business owner, you have to be uh, passing over control to the EOP. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of conditions, other conditions to meet, uh, but fundamentally, if you meet them all, then you get a 0% tax rate um, as, you know, on your shares. So you wouldn't be paying tax at either 10 or 20%, which are the current rates. Um, if you do that, you've got to meet the conditions for a certain period of time as a shareholder. So all the conditions have got to be in place um, to the end of the tax year following the year of the deal. If anything, if any conditions fail during that period, the gain is just taxed as an ordinary trade, so, uh, you know, ordinary share sale. Uh, so the tax is on, on the shareholders. If any conditions are breached after that point, it actually crystallises a sale at market value for the EOP. So, it, you know, it, that's not where you want to be. So careful planning with all of this. Obviously, we've talked about the aims and objectives and getting it right and making sure that an EOP is the right route to go. But then it's not a one off transaction, you know, execution only. We've done it. We walk away. It's very much a hands on, you know, explaining to the, the people involved what the rules are and making sure that they continue to meet them, you know, all the time. Because once, you know, once you breach the rule, 
you know you've breached it you can't very often undo what you've done um so it's you know fundamentally it's it's it, it is great from a tax point of view but it is really important to get you know the objective set first um and there are lots of um I say lots of flexibility some of the some of the rules are set what you can and can't do within the ER and, and what what you can and can't do for ease but there's quite a bit of flexibility in terms of how it's structured who's involved and I'm sure we'll come on to it in terms of um who the trustees are uh, the directors are obviously still in charge of running the company but the trustees have a duty of care to all the employees so there's um, decisions around who the trust sh trustees should be whether employees are involved I mean I don't know whether in your yours Matt whether you have an employee council or employee um, yeah we, we've 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 tried to do everything um completely best practice in a way so it's absolutely airtight and also so we are genuinely representing what we what we what we think we should do enter into the right spirit so we've got an employee forum we've got the trust which i sit on as a board representative we've got our head of finance who's kind of the team representative and we've got an independent uh, as well on our board um and ultimately the role of the trust as we see it, is to make sure every decision we make is in the best interest of the team and that's what that's what we have to come back to in our central anchor point with every decision we make within the business um, and as Susie said there are certain restricted matters that you just can't do post EOT without the trust sign off um, and you have a say in setting those matters um, but it's certainly not business as usual which I think is sometimes how it's sold in by maybe not as professional advisors that it's a dead easy route and it's just to be business as usual post EOT it's not um, kind of nothing changes but everything changes is what I tend to say to people so yeah I think also from a tax point of view, um, it, it's important for the employees to, to understand that they're not direct share owners, but they do benefit from this. So they can receive up to £3,600 tax free per year as a bonus. Um, national insurance is due on that by the company, but the, and there are certain conditions of making sure that that's fair to everybody. Um, you, you've, you've got to put certain parameters in place of how you pay those bonuses. Um, but there are, you know, there are various um you know, good things for the employees as part of this, and you know, including the owner exiting at zero percent. Mm -hmm. So, well, actually, that leads us to uh, another another question we've had, and it's an anonymous one. But um, how do the the new shareholders post EOT, so the employees, uh, avoid paying tax when they look to sell out in the future? Is is the question they've asked, Susie? Yeah. That, that I feel that one might be aimed at you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so on a future sale. It's the EOT that's selling the shares, the, the Employee Ownership Trust, and that will pay tax at 20%. The money that's then left in that that trust can be paid out to the employees, but that's subject to pay-as-you-earn, so it's ordinary pay-as-you-earn income. Uh, so that, you know, again, that is something to think about when, you, when you're setting these up. You know, some people might sell all, like you have done, Matt, to the, the EOT. Some will sell you know, part of the shares and have a future plan of how they will exit fully at some point. And that is a big consideration that, you know, the, the employee ownership trust will will have money that's then taxed to pay you earn. But I, th I think it's worth saying, that if, you know, if, if your plan is to sell it again in the future, an EOT is not a good structure, generally speaking. You know, there's, there's tax reasons why it's not necessarily the best structure. But fundamentally, if I'm sat there as a trustee, it is a hard decision. I'm sure, you know, if Matt sat there and said, we're going to sell the business to, you know, one of our major competitors who's maybe going to make half the workforce redundant. Well, how as a trustee do you, do you reach the conclusion that that is for the benefit yeah. of, of those employees? That That's a, it's a you know, it's a, it's a high burden of, you know, so you've got to, you're opening yourselves up to being challenged by all those people that don't like the deal you've done, so. Yeah. And, and Anna, I guess, you know, We've talked on some of the, sort of the tax considerations there. Are there some, some other legal sort of considerations we, you need to sort of think about either early on or during that process that you know you might not think about otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I touch more on the on the funding side, but just sort of in general, because of course when we're acting bank or borrower side, we're also reviewing the wider documentation piece. So I think the things that Susie's just touched on, Matt mentioned as well, you know, the, the actual governance of how you're planning on running the business. Because unlike a traditional, <clears throat> excuse me, sale where you've got just a bunch of directors or a bunch of directors, you know, you've got the directors who run the business pass and the directors going forward, you really need to be speaking as a bunch of lawyers with the trust lawyers and with the accountants and working out how the business is going to be run and making sure that that's reflected in the documentation going forward. 
Um, I think a lot of people don't think about that. And suddenly you've got, you know, traditional funding documents or you've got a traditional SPA, which doesn't quite fit this deal. There's a lot of things which are very similar. So I think it's really important that when you're starting the process legally, that you're actually put, putting all the pieces together and discussing, like I say, with the with the trust lawyers, the, the jurisdiction of where the trust is. And again, Susie's touched on this. You, you will often have a Guernsey or Jersey trust, trustee, sorry. And then it's understanding where the EOT is actually established because that can be established in, in England, but that could also be in Jersey or Guernsey, <clears throat> excuse me. And you get, sometimes it's quite complicated from a legal perspective when you've got a trustee in one jurisdiction and you know an incorporated EOT in another. So again, lots of opinions are needed. So you go from being a straightforward SPA transaction to actually having a few sort of complexities. And then the other complexity, if you are getting external funding is security. And I'm seeing that still changing quite a bit now in terms of where the funders are looking to take security. So when I first started doing these, um, the, the lenders generally just took security over the shares um, that the EOT held in the business. Then you would take a debenture from the trading entity. But I'm seeing more and more that actually people are looking to take security directly from the EOT, which it depends on the governance documents whether they can do that. But at the same time, what assets are there in the EOT? All they do is technically hold the shares. Um, so it comes down to, again, whether funds are going directly into, into the EOT or funds are going into the trading company as to the powers and what can be given. So legally, you've got to be thinking about the structure of the EOT going forward and how it's funded and how all those documents are going to fit together. And, and Dan, I sort of, I'm jumping, jumping around a little bit, so apologies, but you've mentioned you've, that Shawbrook's done a number of these now and you, know, you, you feel that they're, 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 they're going well. Because you've done a, done more of them, do you find more of them coming across your desk? And that seems like a silly question, but because it's almost proof of concept that you're happy with them. Yeah, yeah, we're seeing a we're seeing a lot at the moment, actually, a lot, a lot, lot now in particular. Um, uh, and yeah, we probably yeah we probably see most yeah because we have we have done a few and we've been quite vocal about the ones we have done. Um, and there seems to be a lot in the market. It seems to have been increased sort of month on month, year on year, for the last couple of years, I would say. Um, so we're seeing a lot of opportunities in the space, yeah. And, and then, uh, Matt, this, one, uh, this one's going to be one of those ones that you're going to, you, you, it's either going to be a gift or a curse for you, because we did talk about the Employee Ownership Association and their amazing statements that literally it's a silver bullet for any economic challenges is to get in, become an EOT. Yeah. Uh, is it true? You know, do you think that you are, you are more resilient in everything else that goes with that? Uh, I'd love to romantically sit here and say, yeah, it sorted it all overnight and magically we became resilient and our growth and succession plans were sorted and independence and our employee engagement went through the roof. Um, in, in reality, clearly, clearly, no, that's not the case. And I think echoing back to what I said earlier, it comes down to the culture that you've embedded in the organisation long before you've done the EOT and what your aspirations are for it. I think when we announced it to the team, because we did a, a, a big announcement and a role, obviously, when we announced it, it was interesting to see how the team reacted to it, which is one of the first things to know. And I'd say it was probably a third, a third, a third. A third was super excited, really engaged, um, happy that they, they were now owners, which I know uh, Anna, Anna was very clear to say earlier, you have to be careful whether they're, they're not technically the owner, if you know what I mean, with, this, with the trust structure. A third were quite ambivalent to it and like, what's in it for me? How does it benefit me now? Um, and a third were very sceptical, like, what are they up to, you know, trying to unpick it, that there was some kind of weird deal on the go. But we've worked really hard in the months that have followed to, to make it feel real and tangible for the team. Mm -hmm. So we've sat them down and discussed with them what it could mean financially for them in three years, four years, five years, whatever that may be, as the deferred consideration is, is paid to the, to the exiting vendors in a way. And I think when you put more pound notes attached to it in terms of not only have they got a voice in the business and a say in the strategic direction of it, there's actually going to be a financial benefit coming as well. So I feel like we've tried to be super transparent with it, which I think has really helped with our attract and retain. I think it certainly helps you pull in the right talent, helps you retain the right people. Um, in terms of resilience, I think that's a totally separate webinar. Uh, we could touch on that one. Um, but I think employee engagement, it's helped. We've got the employee forum, but we had these kind of mechanisms in play before as well. Um, so I guess time will tell. And I think it's probably too early to, to fully support the statements of the employee ownership yet, uh, the Employee Ownership Association. Um, but I do think being as transparent with your team as you can be on, on completing an EOT is critical. Because I think otherwise it can seem like a bit of a carrot dangling exercise if you're not careful. 
because in reality, the deferred consideration on some of these deals is eight years plus, and you know, Hamish and Susie have probably seen more, but in terms of the, there can be very long payout periods. So until the deferred's paid, what are the, what are the team really getting out of it other than a £3,600 tax-free bonus, which is nice. So I think being as transparent as you can, communicating well with your team certainly will aid all the, all the claims made by the Employee Ownership Association and, and time will tell. And I guess as we're seeing more of them, and, and as, as Dan alluded to, con consistently increasing numbers going across his desk, do you think more that there the needs to be more perhaps discussion between people who've gone through it and who are starting that journey? Because I guess you, having done it, Matt, have a lot of experience of things that you might wish you'd known when you started it versus when, when you ended it. Yeah, I think... Yeah, it was slightly different for me because I, I used to, <laughs> used, to well, used to in a previous life be a, be an accountant, so I was quite aware of it going into it. So, um, having come from a corporate finance background myself, I was quite aware of it. What I would say is there's an awful lot of legality and nuances that go with it, which was way out of my comfort zone. Where we needed to take the advice and clearly understand the implications of it, like Amy says of well, what happens if I disappear from the business? What happens if some of the key players move on? So from a succession perspective, that is, it does not sort your succession plans out in that sense. You need a solid management team. You need a future leaders program of people you're pulling through over the next years that come. So I think the more discussion there is about people that are considering it and people that are either mid-process or have completed the journey and a couple of years into it is critical. So I took advice from people that I knew who'd done it previously, I'm now helping the Employee Ownership Association with people who are thinking about doing it from their perspective as well. So I think the more you can collaborate and have an open discussion about it, for sure, it should benefit everyone. I think it's a really interesting point on succession for me, which is I think it, it definitely helps your attention at the, sort of, if you call it the junior and the mid-levels. Yeah. I think at the senior levels, it can potentially cause you bigger challenges because you know if you've got competitors who are offering people EMI share options and they can actually get a far bigger slice of the pie as the leader of the business or one of the senior members of the senior leadership team, then in actual fact, you need to be thinking about that going forward as well. And how, how do you make sure you either retain or attract those people into the business, not you know in five years time, who are gonna be the new, the new MD of that business, so. You can offer EMI schemes or can't you under the ALT? Yeah. You, you can, but it kind of flies in the face of the culture. If you're saying it's egalitarian and everybody yeah. ranks equal and everybody shares in the reward the same, but then you yeah. parachute in a senior person who wants 20% share options, well, that's yeah. taking 20% off the table for the team that you've just said a sharing in it. So it's quite at odds. And it was something that was clearly explained to us as part of the process that you can do it, but obviously the ability to attract senior level candidates who may want significant EMI stakes could be compromised. So, yeah. I also think it's, again, I think it's, it's far easier to do that at the time you, you know, make sure you, you put the EMI in place at the start, because again, as a trustee, if the EMI is not in place at the point where I become a trustee, it's quite, again, it's quite a big decision to say, I think this is to the benefit of all the employees for me to give away, you know, 20% of the business to a new MD. Yeah, Hamish, on, on, on that, I've interesting point about resale and stuff like that so do you think the more EOTs that are done now then that will affect the mergers and acquisitions market going forward yeah I think, I think those, 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 those businesses will become far more like the sort of German cooperative type businesses you see out there you know whereby you know typically what do they do where they reinvest you know something like 90 percent of their profit back into the business to make the business stronger tomorrow than it is today. And, you know, if you look at where the government have probably come at from this, that is, I suspect, part of the thought process behind this, which is you have a period of time over which that deferred gets paid. And then you've only really got two things you can do with the money, which is you can pay it out to the beneficiaries or you reinvest it to make the business, you know, better and stronger tomorrow. Um, but they're far more likely to stay in long term, you know, private ownership. Quite an interesting, interesting one, particularly when we're seeing such a, you know, an active M&A market at the minute, that, that, you know, the impact this could have longer term on that. Um, I guess I've got to, got to ask the, the, one of the final questions, which is always, do we all expect this trend to continue? Obviously, Dan's saying it is, it's going year on year, month on month, his desk's getting higher and higher. Everyone's calling him up saying, will Shawbuck fund REOT? Do, does, does the whole, do all the other panellists agree? And I'm going to start 
I'm going to start with you, Anna, because you nodded at me again. You made that fatal error. You twitched. You I know. I keep, I keep doing it, don't I? Um, yeah. I, don't know. I keep, I keep hearing we're down. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I do agree. Um, it genuinely, from my perspective, it's something which really has just sort of grown and grown in the last couple of years. And you know, it could be at the point now where I've got two on my desk at any time, whether that's lender side or or company side. Um, like I said before, I think just general understanding and just awareness. It sounds sounds silly but if you're not from the accounting or the tax world and you're not you know that familiar with m a work it, it is still quite new to people um but actually understanding it seeing other businesses do it um it's just another option that people are at least considering whether it's the right thing or not but yeah i can't see it slowing down anytime soon because there's still a lot of players from a finance perspective that haven't got there yet so they're still catching up susie because you're next one yeah, I, I agree, but I think it's really important that that they aren't sold as a tax product. And I think Anna, you made a, an interesting comment about um, some of the trustees being offshore. Mm -hmm. And the reason people do that is that on eventual sale, the trustees then don't pay capital gains tax. And I think you know, for me, that that I would question that decision and why you know why they've done that because tax absolutely shouldn't drive the decision um, to to go down this route. And I think if people are just hamstrung on on the tax breaks that that are available we could well end up with you know some problems in in future years i think it's really important that they're, they're done properly as a means of passing the business on in 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 the best way possible not just because of the tax i think for you know certainly for for the type of clients we deal with i would be i, I wouldn't want an offshore trust involved because i think you know they they have to have some hands on you've got to be able to control the management from the UK. Matt? Yeah, that's the same, really. I think they'll, they'll continue to increase so long as the government supports the scheme and um, obviously heavily depend on what happens with capital gains tax and so on in the wider, in the wider world. Um, and I also think linked to the, the global talent shortage that we're seeing at the minute and the war to attract and retain the best people to your team. I think as an employer and business, you've got more chance of doing that and more success. We've talked about the complications with senior individuals, but I think as an employer and business where you've got a voice, hopefully that, that aids you in, in that space as well, which is you know, one, of, one of the main factors a lot of businesses are struggling with. So yeah, I, I can't see it reducing at all. On that, has it, has it helped you with attracting the retainers to that time? Yeah, absolutely. But I think, but I, I always come back to it. I think it's the wider culture impacts. Again, it's having the right culture set. But I think when you are interviewing candidates and they're going for a job, that's paying, you know, living wage or minimum wage, and we're saying no, we're an employer and business, but you can share in the upside of the business, so on and so on, and and um, you know, walking them through it. I think it tells quite a compelling story if if you're authentic and true to why you've done it, um, which which we were and are. Um, it can easily be unpicked, obviously, if you've just done it for the tax reasons, as everybody said. So, Amish, your view? Yeah, I definitely think think that we'll we'll see more of them going forward. Um, but the, the other point I'd make is that I always say that they're probably suitable for about 5% of businesses. I think they're now something which you should be discussing if you're looking at your exit options. I think they are one of those that you should you should look at. But, you know, you need to pick the right exit option for you, not be driven by other things and, you know, and, and make sure you, you have considered everything properly. Uh, and, and Dan, your view on it? Yeah, I think I said before, I think that, that, that it'll continue to 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 um to evolve and i think that yeah we'll see more coming through as we have been year on year i think like hamish said it's uh, important to understand if it is the right um right strategy for your business and whether it's the right fit but um yeah i see it see see, see more happening on an ongoing basis uh, and we have another question that's come in as we, we're coming to close but it's uh well someone who, who wishes to remain anonymous but uh they mentioned that we touched on it, that is there a concern that senior management who may have had the aspirations of an MBO and they put in brackets, uh, albeit unrealistic, or a part ownership becoming disincentivized? And what solutions have you already seen or, or do you envisage uh, moving forward for senior management to meet those, those aspirations and EOT as a concept? Is, is, anyone, is anyone seeing anything? You know, I know we talked about the AMI and option and, but are there other, other potential ways to, to get around that, do you see? I think the other bit is just to just understand why do they want to do an MBA? You know, what, what did they want to do an MBA because they saw that as, a, as an ability to get rich in simple terms? Or did they want to do an MBA because they were passionate about the business and driving it forward and, you know, steering the ship? Because 
in actual fact, there's nothing to stop them being able to achieve that. And in some ways, they've actually got a better opportunity to achieve that under an EOT uh, structure. And I think particularly, you know, you listen to what Matt's done, you know, the fact that he's developing future leaders, you know, talking to them clearly and everything else. If he's got people in his business who had, you know, a desire to do an MBO, I suspect they still feel highly motivated because they can still see how they get to those positions. They feel they're being invested in and they know they're going to, you know, financially still do well in the future. If their number one driver is cash, then you are far more down that route of, do you do the sort of EMI type option? Um, and then, you know, as importantly, you know, what happens to those shares and how do they get bought back and how do they get valued and all that side of things? That's, it's, it's fascinating. And I think, yeah, it's definitely interesting to see how, well, not only are they growing, you know, or well, they're coming across my desk regularly from news stories perspective. So if they're doing that, I'm the end of the line to this, whereas Dan, you're far, far earlier in this. So if they were, you've still got loads coming across your desk, then I'm, I'm certain to be busy writing about them for the foreseeable future. But it's definitely, it's definitely interesting to see how the trend's continuing, but also perhaps in some ways to, to break the myth that they're a silver bullet, Matt, mm -hmm. which I think was safely your statement. There are potentially great options and they are there are great tax benefits, Susie, but that really don't do it just for tax reasons and don't do it just because you think you should. That you need to make sure it is far more a coherent working product uh, and that you have the infrastructure, and it might be the right word to use, in place uh, with the culture. So I think I will draw that to a close. But So thank you very much to all our panellists. Thank you to everyone, all of you who've joined us today. It's certainly been an interesting discussion and I'm certain there'll be more coming on on uh, employee ownership trusts from the business desk and Sherbrooke Bank in the coming weeks. Uh, and if you do have any questions, do email us uh, at the business desk and we will pass them on to our panelists and attempt to get answers for you if you did not feel comfortable saying them today. Uh, as I say, thank you very much again, everyone. And I hope you all have a fant fantastic Friday and a good long weekend. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.